Mass vaccination is rolling out, eclipsing the pace of the COVID-19 lockdowns more than one year ago. While this may turn out to be a huge success in combating the virus, it's still too early to say as studies will not be finished until 2023. What we do know is that governments around the world, including those in the richest countries, have caused irreparable harm to their citizens, throwing out the rule book on pandemics and providing little scientific justification for their actions, all the while telling us to follow the science. Big questions still remain such as why no early treatment is available in some countries when doctors have demonstrated the effectiveness of safe, inexpensive drugs to combat hospitalization and death. Did our system of public health decision making during COVID really serve the public interest and is there sufficient transparency? Mainstream media and big tech have become so compromised a scandal in itself that they are unwilling to expose wrongdoing and may have functioned as important enablers of destructive policy making. And why are the issues of liberty and freedom of speech being ignored by our democratically elected leaders? Why after the availability of these vaccines are we still hearing threats of lockdowns, the need for vaccine passports, masks, vaccines for children and other crazy suggestions from politicians and unaccountable public health officials. John O'Sullivan is CEO of Principia Scientific International. That's an organization dedicated to truth and transparency and promoting best scientific practice in the community and the education of specialists and non-specialists. John O'Sullivan, thanks very much for joining us. It's a pleasure, Mike. The conflict of interest issues in this pandemic, where would you see the most glaring or dangerous examples? Well, I mean, I'll, I'll start off with the example here in the UK, because obviously I know most about the UK because I'm here. Uh, we've got a, a growing issue with our politicians who seem to be making a lot of money on the side, awarding contracts to their friends. Um, for example, um, I'll give you an example. The, the Chancellor, uh, he himself has actually been questioned about his uh, involvement in, in vaccine profiteering. And he's flat out denied that won't, won't provide any evidence one way or the other. He won't confirm or deny. So that's not really uh, very inspiring to hear the, the chance of the chief executive of the government's finance not coming clean and being honest and open about where the money comes and goes. Um, another issue that we have is um, the fact that um, SAGE, the committee that, in, that uh, advises the UK government, I mean, they're put forward as a kind of a panel of experts and we question these experts because they seem to be mostly from the vaccine industry. Um, so surely there's a conflict of interest there if they're giving advice to the government when out of the 20 m members on the panel, I think 12 of them are directly involved in vaccine or big pharma uh, companies. So as a public uh, concern, I think we should a bit more of a, a kind of an investigation on that. And, uh, you know, there are members of parliament here who are saying this, this is going a bit too far. Um, and I'm sure you'll find it in other countries. For example, in America, there's the issue of Tony Fauci. People may know Tony Fauci because he was uh, Donald Trump's White House spokesman on the health of, of the coronavirus. And uh, he was prominent uh, in pushing the vaccines. Um, what we know about the Tony Fauci is um, he personally oversees $500 million worth of vaccine investments. So again, another individual who would say, well, possibly not the most independent and impartial person to be giving advice in a pandemic. Um, but this is what we've got at the moment. We've got uh, no real accountability. Interesting also, just uh, sort of a sidebar here, um, the CEO of, of Pfizer um, said he hasn't had the shot yet. He's um, going to let others have it first. A lot of confidence there, not. He's yeah. such a humanitarian, obviously. You know, why, why put himself at the front of the queue? That's right. Um, He's the greater good of, for himself. Yeah, and, and surely uh, somebody like that should lead by example. I mean, you've got the politicians stepping forward who appear to be having a shot. In, in, in the UK, we've got the royal family. Um, apparently Prince Philip had the shot the other week and then the and Queen. So 
these are fantastic role models. We should all be following their, their example. But you see, the problem is that everything is hidden. It, there's no real scrutiny. Mm. We to believe uh, what the politicians tell us. And the problem we have in, in not just the UK, but our colleagues in Australia and America, is we are we're sending out freedom of information requests to these governments and saying, well, can you please give us some evidence? You know, can you please provide proof that there is actually a, a COVID-19 virus, the SARS-2 virus itself, has not even been proven to exist, according to many scientists. And sure enough, we've had replies. We've had replies from the governments in Ireland, the UK, Canada, and the US, even the CDC has come clean and said, well, we, we don't actually hold an isolate. There's no isolate of the virus. That's curious, really, because there's always somebody else who seems to hold the evidence. Never the government itself, and so they're passing the buck there. So you know, it concerns us. It, to, to us, my colleagues and I, we've been working on the global warming controversy for 10, 15 years. And it, to us, it's the same modus operandi, where you see a lot of data is kept behind closed doors. And when you try and send in these freedom of information requests, you get to, like a stone wall. You don't really get any access to the proof. And one of the things that we struck us is, one year into this pandemic now, and of course that's one whole year of data, we've been through all four seasons. And as we all know, flu season is where you get most illness. And sure enough, we got the, in England and in the UK, we've got the Office of National Statistics, and we've got Public Health England, and uh, our number crunches here at PSPSI have said, look, well, let's have a look at this data. And they compared previous years with uh, 2021, uh, 20, and we found that uh, Lo and behold, there was nothing unusual about the past year's mortality rates. And it's very strange. So where are all these dead, uh, deaths coming from? And we found that, sure enough, the death rates from influenza and pneumonia are, are, are almost non-existent. It seems all this mask wearing and social distancing has had a massive and miraculous effect on, on these other diseases. Yet COVID cases are, you know, as you, as you know, in your own country, they're, they're, they're headline news, cases, cases, cases. Um, but we're not impressed by that at all. So we, we mm. do have a lot of questions and we're not getting the answers we want. Mm. And the media is certainly not helping. Journalism doesn't seem to be practiced these days. It's left to people like uh, ourselves and yourselves, alternative news sources to, to try and dig out the truth. Well, as Jack Nicholson said, Maybe they can't handle the truth. Now, John, has this pandemic really exposed problems at the very top of the public health system and how decisions are made? Yeah, we, we've noticed that um, when, you, when you scratch the surface, what's going on here is that uh, the World Health Organization has, you know, since 1948, been given more and more powers. And every, every government in the world seems to be uh, delegating, passing the buck to the World Health Organization to make decisions on their own nation's health policy. And sure enough, that when you scratch the surface of the World Health Organization, who are these people? Um, like, lo and behold, if, I'm sure you know yourself, if you, if you look at uh, companies that uh, are so-called public government uh, entities, they're not. They're actually private corporations. Uh, Give you a good example, the Federal Reserve in America. People think, well, the Federal Reserve, that's obviously the government. Well, no, it's a private bank. Um, in England, uh, the Bank of England, you think, well, that's a government entity. Well, no, it's a private bank. Uh, and this is what we've got, you know, and the World Health Organization, well, who are they? Well, I'll tell you who they are. Essentially, the biggest, one of the biggest funders of the World Health Organization is Bill Gates. And sure enough, Bill Gates is uh, one of those egomaniacs that he wanted to have status as a nation. He, um, only a few years ago, in 2010, I think it was, that uh, he applied for status as, as an individual, as, as a nation, to have parity. And of course, uh, that didn't fly. His ego didn't get through the door. And uh, he tried a different tack. And sure enough, what he did is buy third-party contracts. So now, in effect, Bill Gates has the status of a nation, but through uh, the process of having third-party control of contracts. So every contract for, for, for a vaccine that goes through the World Health Organization has to have Bill Gates approval. So you can imagine there that uh, Bill Gates is a, a very big player in this whole thing. 
There's been a lot written though about the positive influence of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation on vaccine development. Um, on the other side though, uh, Dr. Vladimir Zelenko said, it's odd though that a guy who said that in 2015, I think it was, that we needed to have 300 million people less on the planet to survive. And yet he's so involved with vaccine development and uh, he said something doesn't quite gel. You most likely agree with those thoughts. Yeah, unfortunately, uh, I, I would think uh, Bill Gates, being the genius that he is, he's probably on the autistic spectrum and he's not gifted with the best social skills because he gave a TED talk a few years ago where he said if we do a very, very good job on vaccines, we can actually drastically reduce the population. And people are thinking, well, what does that mean, Bill? How, don't vaccines save lives? Should that, uh, where's the connection? And, and we look at the evidence, what's Bill Gates achieved? He, he's a philanthropist, but uh, his exploits so far in the world of vaccines have caused more harm than, than good. Mm. Uh, for example, one of the biggest critics of, of uh, Bill Gates is none other than Robert Kennedy Jr. Robert Kennedy Jr. has been very successful as a lawyer in America. He's the, he's the son of uh, Bobby Kennedy and the nephew of JFK. Mm. And sure enough, <laughs> Um, it's been proven that Bill Gates has caused considerable deaths in Africa and India. And finally, how that fits the eugenics movement's narrative, where the white supremacy is, is sure, you know, part, of the, part and parcel of the role of um, saving lives. The only lives they're saving are their own, really. Mm. And it's noted that Bill Gates refused to vaccinate his own children. Again, that, that's not a good role model. As you said, the head of Pfizer, these people, they're quite hypocritical in what they advocate. Your company, Principia Scientific International, was formed to combat increased corporate and governmental meddling in science. Can you tell us about this? Yeah, we uh, essentially were formed by a group of 20 international scientists, mainly applied scientists and engineers, STEM, STEM field people, who were critical of academics using computer models, uh, especially for global warming narrative. And we noted that these people, these academics, had no experience of industry. Uh, nothing was tested empirically. Everything was taken on face value. And, and sure enough, we're in the same scenario. Deja vu in, in England, we've got uh, Professor Ferguson, who's perhaps the most incompetent uh, scientist in the world, who not only incompetently predicted massive millions of deaths from the coronavirus, did the same thing with mad cow disease and uh, swine flu. And yet the same people, the same academics keep coming out, wheeled out from the woodwork and, and given their prime spot in the media as experts, again, making the same mistakes. So, you know, our concern going back 10 or 15 years is it's always the same people, always academics, always with impeccable credentials as academics and always the government favorite. And, and yet the track record you know, doesn't doesn't hold uh, doesn't hold water. So what we'd like to say to people is uh, always investigate. You know, put things to the test. You know, being applied scientists and engineers, we do figure out things that when you test things, if they don't work, then you drop them. So just to give you an example, the um, the issue with um, wearing masks. You know, I mean, I'm I'm not a medical expert, but I do speak to a lot of medical experts, and they say, well, the whole issue of wearing masks is completely unproven. There, there's never been a, anything done anywhere on a mass scale of wearing masks in the mm. population. This isn't scientifically based, this is purely politics. Yeah. And as you know yourself, everywhere you go, I mean, I, I see it today, I go to the supermarket, I see 80% of the people wearing masks. Um, we comply, we, uh, we're scientifically illiterate as a population, we don't really know what to believe, and we, we trust our politicians to tell the truth, and, but... Uh, when they've got vested interests in the big pharma, we're possibly putting our faith in the wrong people. What about the role of mainstream media and social media and their part in censorship during this pandemic? Now, personally, I hold, I hold them accountable more than the most because they are the voice. They're what the, the public read, hear, see, you know, almost feel. And um, truly, you, you touched on it before, but I think journalism, and Trish Wood said this from trishwoodpodcast.com, she said the same thing, that they're not asking the hard questions. Um, it's just as if they're a, a voice for big tech and government. 
Exactly. They seem to be upholding the narrative. There's never questioning of a narrative. Um, I'll give you an example. I mean, you possibly have heard of the Great Barrington Declaration, where something in the order of 100,000 doctors, medical doctors, have said, well, the, all these measures for this pandemic, they're, they're, they're wacky. They don't make any sense scientifically. And, um, and yet, you, you look on the mainstream media, and you'll never hear of the Great Barrington Declaration. You know, such a large body of doctors, experts in their field, do not have a platform. The only place they get a platform is on alternative media. And another example, a good example like this week, today actually, we posted an article for, apparently the FDA in America has given a warning to a doctor, Dr. Joseph Mercola, who is very prominent in uh, promoting uh, alternative therapies, anti-narrative, anti-government narrative, and his great crime was suggesting that vitamin D was a, a great uh, prophylactic for, for getting diseases, including coronavirus. And for that simple statement, he's been threatened with the, the, the banishment from the media. Uh, we get it ourselves all the time. I mean, our, our organisation has been deplatformed you know, by Facebook, and we had to complain and get reinstated. Um, I personally have been banned by different organisations. Um, Twitter is forever shadow banning us. I mean, we, we post something and lo and behold, nobody reads it because we think it's on, online, but the clever tech boys in Facebook and so forth, they're, they're very good at hiding things. So, yeah, it's an uphill battle, as you know yourself. It's uh, big media seems to have a, a hand, in it, a finger in the pot here. They're, they're part of the problem. It's sort of almost like a, a badge, though, of founders that um, I don't want to wear mine because they might think I'm some wacko, but but truly, it's. Um, I mean, if you if you if you want want to just discuss something such as COVID or uh, climate change, uh, both are associated with the word emergency, which the left love, because it means they can do things that normally they couldn't do and achieve their goals of, you know, put put in process, put in into a play the the great the great you know, the global reset, for example. But the I just I, I find that if we can't discuss. I mean, look at McBride um, when he um, came out with the, 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 uh, his discovery on uh, thalidomide. Take away that discussion. What do we have? Well, a lot of it, I mean, it's anecdotal. We, I mean, we're lucky. You mentioned uh, thalidomide and, and obviously the older generation, people of my age, we know all this. We grew up with it. We saw the victims of that experiment by Big Pharma. You know, I, I've had, I was going to school with friends who had fingers and arms and limbs missing. Mm. Uh, these people suffered because Big Pharma, in their wisdom, decided to use them as, as guinea pigs. And we've never gotten away from that. And the same uh, mantra is always spoken that lessons will be learned. That, well, you know, we'll get it right next time. But they never do. Because the issue here is, is greed. And sure enough, uh, Prime Minister of the UK, Boris Johnson, made a massive gaffe here this week when he got up in Parliament and said uh, greed is good, effectively, both about the success of the rollout of the vaccine programme in, in the UK and how it was good to be greedy. It's all these greedy uh, big pharma interests that rushed through the vaccine and, and Britain's great success, where we vaccinated the claim is a third of the population have taken this jab. I mean, I'm shocked that, you know... <laughs> I'm proud, obviously, being proud to be British, but the, the sensibilities of my countrymen and women is pretty shocking if they can just glibly accept a jab that's not been thoroughly tested. I mean, anybody knows the flu vaccine, for example, that, that's been around for generations, a couple of generations, you could argue, and uh, every year they have to prepare two or three different vaccines, not knowing what the virus will be, what, what they're going to have to deal with, and... 50% success rate for, for a vaccine like that, you know, again, you know, we're talking about uh, things that aren't based on science, they're based on profit, and, you know, the cynic in me always says that, uh, follow the money, and it's a famous saying, as you know, follow the money. Or, if it ain't about the money, it really is about the money. Look at ivermectin. I think it costs about $2 to make for each person. Um, yeah. There's just no money in that, even though it works. There's no money in that. And therefore, um, what we'll have to do is not talk about it because people will understand, though, that it's about the money and not about 
just not about for the greater good. It's for the greater good of corporations, isn't it? It's a very sad uh, truism here that, um, you know, the people with the most money, they tend to have the most power. And they control the media, and it's, uh, they, they talk about conspiracy theory. Well, I, that's such a glib term, and I say, well, the biggest conspiracy theorist you'll ever meet would be a criminal prosecutor, because that's their job. Mm. Criminal, conspiracies are prosecuted every day in the criminal courts. You know, this is not uh, a wishy-washy term. I mean, it's a fact. You know, a conspiracy happens all the time, and we saw it in the banking crisis in 2008. You know, bankers were getting away with murder. Mm. And it never changes, and this is the, the sad um, sadness of losing Donald Trump as President of the United States is, uh, is a travesty, because he was somebody a lot of us felt could uh, get the job done, and, um, and he was apparently... Well, from what I can see, doing a pretty good job, but um, no, he's, uh, he wasn't uh, acceptable to the, the billionaire class, he had to go. Are you prepared to make any predictions about vaccine policy, and if things will get worse, or will they get better in the near future? Yeah, the, what, what I'm finding is speaking to a lot of medical experts, and they're saying that the issue here with this vaccination program is it probably not the first uh, tranche of vaccines is going to cause a problem, it's the second or the third. And we're now having policies where governments are talking about uh, biannual vaccinations, that it's going to be year-round. Now, when you look at the ingredients of what goes in vaccines, it's pretty shocking. I mean, formaldehyde, for example. I mean, formaldehyde, if you know what that is, that's the embalming fluid, and that, that was banned. My, my mother actually worked in surgical supplies and engineering. And she said, well, that was banned because it was dangerous, and, and yet they're putting it into vaccines. So it is a cumulative effect. It's a toxin. You know, there are toxins in, in, in these vaccines, and over time, it, it's, a, it's a building crisis. So my prediction is that there will be more deaths. There will be probably an uprising. I, I, I sense that uh, the, the lawsuit's going through right now. Uh, Dr. Fulmeck in Germany is uh, prominent in those lawsuits. There will be accountability in the courts. Uh, there will be suits, obviously lawsuits. And, and the shocking thing is, Mike, that um, lo and behold, Bill Gates has had legal immunity. Mm. Why do you need legal immunity if he's doing nothing wrong? If he's such a, a, a loving philanthropist, you know, it's a lot of shady deals here. And I think the public are going to get wind of this, and there's going to be a lot of fuss, a lot of hullabaloo coming coming their way soon. We'll have to talk about these other things on another time because it's getting late for you. Thank you for staying up. Uh, I, have to, I have to confess here that uh, we did get the times mixed up uh, the day before and, uh, uh, and I understand that you weren't going to do an interview at 1am. So, so thank you very much. It's a pleasure to talk with you, but 1am is a bit too late for me. But another time I would be delighted to appear. Yeah, you, and you're very relaxed. I'm not too sure whether that's uh, sleep setting in or just that we're having this lovely conversation or maybe a couple I, of reds beforehand. Yeah, such a good interview, Mike. You put me up my ease straight away, so I appreciate that. You're very good to do. Now, if somebody wants to find out more about uh, your thoughts, how do they do that? Well, we suggest you go to our website. Uh, you can either Google Principia Scientific uh, International or the website is principia-scientific.org. Um, we've got loads of material there. It's all independently verified and peer-reviewed. and we, It's all free. There's nothing you have to pay for. So come and check it out. And like we say to everybody, take nobody's word for it. You know, don't trust us. Don't trust the media. Don't, and certainly don't trust your politicians. You know, figure things out for yourself. The vaccine itself. Um, I mean, you know, there's a lot, of, a lot of pressure on everybody to, to take this vaccine. But, you know, it's, it's only partway through a trial. And so what you're doing is you're being part of a, uh, of a trial. You're the guinea pig. Exactly. And this is... Some people are calling this a crime against humanity. And Dr. Fulmack in Germany, who is noted for his success in exposing the VW Audi diesel testing scam. As you probably, you heard of that, billions of dollars there and another scam, you know, all that profit. This high-powered lawyer is saying this is on the level of the Nuremberg trials. These are crimes against humanity and the people in power, the politicians, the key figures in the vaccine companies, the Bill Gateses, these people should be brought to justice. Okay, I'm going to 
wind this up in a second, John, but I need to ask you this. This is because it's so late and I understand that the, the brain is in a relaxed mode. Um, in one word, a one word answer to these three, the, these three things I'll throw up at you. Okay, first one is media. One word answer. Corrupt. Big tech. Corrupt. <laughs> okay, uh, government. Corrupt. Excellent. That, was, that wasn't that hard, was it? It was very easy. <laughs> John O'Sullivan, thank you very much. Pleasure, Mike. John O'Sullivan. And that's it for Asia Pacific Today. Thanks for joining us. I'm Mike Ryan.